So the attendees at Google I.O. this year were met or greeted by the sight of these things placed all around the uh, conference center. And I don't hesitate to use the word things uh, to refer to these because this is very much an Internet of Things uh, experiment. So these are moats. These are sensor moats. And I decided because it's pretty much an English word, I should put an explanation, although unfortunately the, English, the explanation is also in uh, English. But these are sensor moats, and they were placed strategically around the three floors of the Moscone Center where the event was being held in order to gather environmental data. They were attached to a sign, a sign that made it clear that they were meant to be here and to explain kind of what they were doing. In total, there were 500 sensors, and they were placed in the session rooms, in the corridors, uh, it, under the counters and on top of the counters in the sandbox area, and at the top and bottom of the escalators and stairs, and also at the entrance and exits of the very large areas, such as the food hall and the keynote room. The keynote room was also used for the Google I.O. after party. This map is part of our administration interface. Uh, it's basically using the Google Maps API. And because we didn't have an indoor positioning system, it's more of a map of where the sensor moats should have been and not a map of where they actually were. So these were the sensor moats, and for those that are interested, how many people play around with Arduinos? Okay, so a few of you, yeah. So these are Arduino uh, Leonardo R3 uh, boards with custom shields, the shields we had manufactured for us. Uh, each of the 500 sensor moats had a set of common sensors. Uh, they had a sensor for temperature and pressure, a sensor for audio noise, a sensor for humidity, and a sensor for light. There were also 300 of the sensors that had custom or speciality sensors. Uh, 100 of them had an RF loop for measuring RF noise. 100 of them had uh, a motion sensor, which was attach attached to a pressure pad. Uh, pressure pads of various different sizes that were placed underneath the carpets and the mats. And the other one was air quality. Uh, so 100 of them had air quality sensors. The moats were divided up into 20 networks, 20 mesh networks, and each network had a gateway node. Now, the moats had to be placed out in the open because they were measuring environmental data, uh, but the gateway node could be, uh, would need to be hidden away because it was particularly important that nobody unplugged the gateway node or walked off with the gateway node. We could afford to lose some of the moats, but we couldn't afford to lose a gateway node that would have taken that entire mesh network offline. So we hid them away. So there's an interesting story about that. We went to quite a lot of effort to actually hide these so people couldn't find them. Uh, and when we went to tear down the event, it was extremely difficult for us to find them again. So, so we had to kind of search around, and ultimately, ultimately we found 19 of the 20. So that was quite a good return. Uh, the nodes communicate with each other uh, using XB Pro radios. Uh, using a thing called the Zigbee protocol. And while this was on the Wi-Fi wi frequency, uh, it was on a channel that was carefully chosen not to interfere with the Wi-Fi network. Uh, the moats send out data bursts every 20 seconds, and this data is gathered up by, the, uh, by a thing called the Device Cloud, which is a piece of software provided by one of our partners. Uh, device Cloud attached some metadata to the data, uh, including the timestamp, because unfortunately the sensor moats didn't add timestamps to the data, so the device cloud added timestamps. The data was then forwarded onto a custom application that we wrote specifically for uh, this project, and the data was then processed, transformed, and stored. And once it was stored, we could use it to do visualizations and run queries against it. We had much interest. Uh, this is the uh, cloud platform sandbox area. We had, we had a spe specific area set aside for the sensor moats. And we had a lot of interest. We had lots and lots of different questions. There were three kind of main groups of questions. Uh, the first one were uh, from people who wanted to know how they were constructed. Uh, those guys were quite easy to spot because they would walk up to the booth and say, hey, is that an Arduino board? Uh, the other group was interested in actually building something very similar. Uh, and the two main use cases for that were building sensor networks in a house, on a much smaller scale, obviously, 
or building centre networks on a farm or some other agricultural uh, effort. Uh, the final group of people were interested in what data we were collecting and what we were planning to do with it once we had it. It's interesting, on the first day, uh, there was some talk, uh, some discussion, some speculation that we were reading the NFC tags in attendees' badges so that we could actually track where they were, where individual people were moving. And some people were concerned that we were recording their conversations or that we were recording their phone calls. That was absolutely not the case. There was no personally identifiable, identifiable information uh, that we gathered at all. So, let's talk about the data. Uh, the audio sensors, the RF sensors, basically measured sound levels uh, for it, throughout the events and RF radiation levels between 600 megahertz and 1 gigahertz. Uh, the air quality sensor measured some fairly broad aspects of the quality of the air. And the motion sensors, uh, they measured the movement of people throughout the auditorium. We were not really concerned with absolute measurements. We weren't concerned what the temperature was within a particular room. We weren't concerned how loud it was within a particular room. We were concerned with changes in the measurements as the event uh, progressed. And we were also interested in how changes in the measurement correlated with things that happened during the event. And we were also interested in how changes in one measurement correlated with changes in others. This particular uh, visualization shows people walking through uh, the conference on the first day. Uh, the gray area that's highlighted is the, uh, is the registration period. The registration period opened up at 7 o'clock in the morning and the keynote started at 9 o'clock in the morning. So you can see a lot of activity from 7 o'clock and <coughs> kind of tailing off about half past 8. So everybody had taken their seats by about half past 8. Uh, it's interesting to note that those are the three floors, blue, uh, orange, and green, uh, but the keynote room was on the third floor, so everybody had to go through the second floor to get to the keynote room. So maybe that's the kind of thing that we should change in the future. There's too much movement, too many escalators. The next visualization is one where we can, we can ask, start to ask data, uh, questions of the data. That's what this is all about, being able to ask questions of the data. And so in this case, we want to ask the question, how does the quality of the air change as people move through the conference center uh, during the event? And so these two graphs, uh, the bottom one is pretty much an expanded version of the one you saw before, uh, measuring the number of steps throughout the uh, conference on the first day. And the one above it is uh, air quality, changes in air quality throughout that same period. Now you can see that there is a dramatic correlation between the people moving around through the event and the change in air quality. In fact, I've looked at this slide, this visualization so many times now that I kind of look, think I have to go back and look at the data again because there is something very strange going on here. But we do see an answer to the question. You know, there is some correlation between the change in air quality and the movement in the events. What we could do now is we could actually ask more questions of the data. We could drill down, uh, go down a bit further, or we could decide we need to refine our models or maybe even think of new ways of changing the experiment so to get better results so that we can understand the correlation. This one is the one we put up uh, on our sandbox uh, to attract people. This kind of visualization, people look at it and they say, oh, what is that? So they come over to talk to you. Uh, so basically, this is the first day. This is the sound levels uh, on the first day. And the first day is the day that we held the Google I.O first day after party. And this 7 o'clock, uh, things started getting a bit dramatic. We had Billy Idol playing, uh, and we also had DJ uh, Steve Aoki playing. So Steve Aoki kind of lost out on the uh, noise levels. Uh, Billy Idol was a bit louder. The problem was that nobody told anybody that Steve Aoki was playing, so when they heard Billy Idol was on, they all went home, and they missed Steve Aoki. So that's a shame. So the heart of all of this analysis is Google BigQuery. BigQuery allows us to rapidly make ad hoc queries against massive data sets uh, using an SQL-like language. And it gives us results back, answers back in seconds and not minutes or hours. And BigQuery is actually an, an API. And tools such as the BigQuery console that we see here is uh, actually built on top of that API. 
And the tool that provided the visualizations on the previous slide, Tableau Software, is also built on top of the uh, BigQuery API. Uh, it makes queries to BigQuery via the API, gets results back, and then renders those results as graphs and charts. So let's talk about how data was actually pushed into BigQuery. We have a very basic data pipeline. Uh, we had to ingest the data, then we had to process the data, then we have to store the data, and then we have to finally ingest the data into BigQuery. So how do we do that? So multiple stages, multiple components of the Google Cloud Platform, although really seriously, you could probably use any other cloud platform, maybe apart from BigQuery, which is kind of the heart of this whole experiment. But we ingest data, uh, sensor data, via this app engine application. Now, Google App Engine is our platform as a service offering. Uh, it has four uh, language runtimes. It now has PHP. It also has Java, Python, and Go runtimes. But it also has many services and APIs that make it extremely powerful. And we made use of many of those uh, during this processing stage. So we would actually process the data uh, uh, out of band of the request response cycle, because App Engine has a a request deadline of 60 seconds. So when we receive a request from a user, we have to respond within 60 seconds, or you, your application has to respond in 60 seconds, otherwise it will time out and an error will occur. So we use this thing called App Engine Task Queues to actually push uh, this processing task, the processing of the data, uh, off to an asynchronous background task. Uh, so task queues were extremely powerful in that case, and that's a very common use case. Once App Engine had done the work of actually processing a lump of data, it needed to store it somewhere. And what we did was store it into Google Cloud Storage. Google Cloud Storage is a bucket-based uh, service uh, for storing data, unstructured data, pretty much any size. App Engine didn't immediately send processed data to Cloud Storage. It would batch up a bunch of data before sending it on. So now what we need to do is we need to get the data from Google Cloud Storage into Google BigQuery. One of the reasons we put the data into Google Cloud Storage is that is the recommended way of ingesting data into uh, Google BigQuery. So in order to make this work, we needed something else, some other task running. Uh, and for that, we use Google Compute Engine. And Compute Engine is the infrastructure as a service offering from Google. And uh, basically, you can spin up VMs in the cloud. Uh, we could have used App Engine for this particular task, but we chose to use Compute Engine because we were already using it for some other tasks. Uh, so we had these instances lying around uh, that could do this long-running, kind of boring task of ingesting data from cloud storage into BigQuery. How this actually works is that App Engine, once it wrote its batch of data out to cloud storage, would create a job which it would put onto a thing called a pull queue. And the pull queue was being monitored by a Compute Engine instance. Now, the Compute Engine instance actually waited for multiple jobs to appear on that queue before pulling them down. Once enough jobs had appeared on the queue, it, the Compute Engine instance pulls the jobs down, and it starts to build a HTTP POST request, which can be sent to BigQuery. Uh, the payload of this request is a JSON object, which contains metadata and also contains references to the table that BigQuery needs to store the data in, and a list of URLs which point to the data that's stored in cloud storage. So once that query is completed, Compute Engine sends it off, HTTP, to BigQuery, and the final step is that BigQuery actually does the ingestion itself. So we've been told that it's been sent this job, it now reads the URLs, understands which table it needs to append to, and it goes off and gets all of the data from cloud storage and appends it to its table. So what we've seen, we've seen the whole, all of the stages that comprise this experiment, from actually deploying the sensors, to having the sensors gathering data and sending the data off to be uh, consumed by an application, the application processing the data and storing the data for future reference, and then also ingesting the data into BigQuery, where we can now start analyzing and asking questions of the data. So 
a few learnings from this. Uh, one thing we didn't do is we didn't use batteries for the moats. That could have helped us out quite considerably because we didn't really work with the event organisers, and that's uh, another learning because this was a fairly last-minute project. So we came up with the plan of where the moats should be deployed, but there weren't necessarily always going to be power sockets available to plug the, mo the moats in. That wouldn't have been a problem if we had batteries, but if we had batteries then, the batteries would have had to last four days, uh, the day we deployed them and the three days of the event. And if we'd had to go and change them, again, we would have had to find them. That would have been quite a laborious process. So we're kind of caught in a, a situation where power, uh, wired power is not good enough and batteries probably not good enough either. So we need longer lasting batteries or more power friendly uh, sensors. Another learning, as I said, is to work with the event organisers more closely on this kind of project. Uh, get in there very early, understand what the layout is of the uh, conference centre, and actually work with them to understand how to deploy the moats. One of the problems we had was that we, we deployed them in the Chrome area, where all the Chrome guys had this fancy aesthetic uh, uh, sandbox. And when they saw them, they took them off and unplugged them and put them in the cupboard. Uh, and the moats don't work very well when they're in the cupboard unplugged. Another thing that we learned, well, another learning that we really wanted to actually uh, implement during the actual development of the application was integration with social media. So we get all of this data, we get these measurements, uh, they tell us things, but they don't really provide a huge amount of context. Now, if we had been able to correlate some changes in measurements with activity in social media, such as Twitter or Google+, then that may have given us some indication of what was going on. So providing context, providing more context for this kind of data gathering operation is extremely important. The other thing, uh, I kind of suggested this, but nobody's really taken me up on it so far, is that we have self-deploying moats. Basically, moats that when we open a box of them, they all jump out and they scurry off to their designated position and sit there for the entire event. And once the event's finished, they come back and jump back in the box. Which should be perfect, but you know, I'm not getting a lot of traction at the moment on that one. In fact, when I told people on the sandbox about this, uh, uh, attendees, they all actually believed me, so I had to kind of like backtrack and say, no, I'm joking. <laughs> so, you know, we have missing moats. Some of our moats did go missing. We lost about 20, uh, like 5% of them. That's not a huge amount, so that was pretty good. If you're really interested in doing something like this, but obviously not probably at the kind of scale that we did it, with 500 of them, you can actually learn more about it at the uh, website. This is the actual App Engine application that was running, uh, datasensinglab.appspot.com. Uh, and we will actually be releasing this software as open source at some point in the future. Uh, you can also start ordering those shields that I, sh uh, I showed you on the sensor notes. Uh, they're already available for pre-order at datasensinglab.com. And also, if you're interested in BigQuery, uh, we have lots of public data sets that you can run queries against. And we have quite a generous uh, free quota that you can use on those public data sets. So if you go to developers.google.com slash BigQuery, you can start to play with BigQuery today. And also, if you're really serious about this, I'd definitely recommend reading Building Wireless Sensor Networks by Rob Faludi. Last thing, I promised in my title that we'd talk about blimps. So guess where the noise is placed in Google I.O. was? We put a sensor in one, one of the blimps that were flying around the auditorium, and that was the noisiest place in Google I.O. Thank you. Cheers. Anyway.